The reviews are in, and we're going to tell you what they are. He's Todd Vandenberg, I'm Rob Steele, and we've got a really great show coming up for you, because not only do we have current movie news, not only do we have a review of The Rise of Skywalker, but we also have the top 10 movies of 2019. Doesn't that just sound like a? it's going to be a great show? Stick around, listen to it. Let's kick it off with just some really, <clears throat> really bizarre timing news, <laughs> um, which actually th- this came out last week. But uh, yeah, go ahead and fillet me for this. I forgot to put it in the show. Oh, um, May 21st, 2021. It's going to be a big day for Keanu Reeves. Because not only does John Wick 4 come out, so does The Matrix number 4. Uh, two different studios, but they're both doing Keanu movies. And I was thinking, let's just push back Bill and Ted 3 until May 21st, 2021. Make it a triple Keanu bill. I think that they're, one of them is going to be moved. We don't so know now, what. Which... I'm, a, I'm with you. They should move the Bill and Ted sequel to the same day. And we'll have a national Keanu awareness, recognition, and love day. Weekend, make it that way. Yeah, there we go. Uh, you see you on Friday, you see you on Saturday, you see you the last one Sunday. It's like your weekend is set. You know exactly what you're going to do. You're going to be happy. Have it hosted by Oprah and Uma to go with Keanu. No. Okay. Although you could, have, you could have the cat from that movie. <laughs> maybe maybe they'll do a sequel to that too. Uh, that is, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's not, no. That would be really surprising if they don't move one of those movies though. That would be really strange. That that it would be. I mean, that usually when there's a, a both of those qualify as blockbusters at this point. Oh yeah. And to have two come out on the same weekend, um, I just can't see that happening. Although Todd, I can see you staying home that weekend and watching the uh, three hour cut of Doctor Sleep instead. I could. Well, that's actually <laughs> on its way. Um, I like Doctor Sleep a lot, and <laughs> since it's based on a Stephen King book, a three hour cut still. <laughs> Barely touches the surface of the, of the book. So yeah, I, I'm down for that. I enjoyed the movie and I can see where there could be a lot more to it. And it would be interesting. Hopefully. One would think. And yet <clears throat> some things that are supposed to be interesting turn out not to be. For example, I have, it's actually a top six list. Ooh. Uh, it, uh, it's reviews that we didn't do. <laughs> neither of us have seen this movie yet. And I think both of us are kind of scared too, really. Yes. Um, it's the greatest reviews I've ever read for a movie, though. And th- these are just these are just he- either the headlines or the first lines of the review for the movie Cats. Yeah, I'm actually more terrified of this movie than I was Doctor Sleep. I, I, I can understand that because the honorable mention review, uh, and this one hit me this morning, uh, didn't quite break the top five, but it fits for our show. Uh, honorable mention a review from the Sci Fi Channel: Only the Quizat Satirac could sit through Cats and emerge whole. <laughs> Um, and that's number six. Brace yourself. Um, number five on this list. On a scale of one to Zemeckis, Hooper's Cats boldly goes beyond the uncanny valley and creates a tear of its own. <laughs> no for one all likes those, this movie. For all those I, who I, suffered I, through the Polar Express. Um, and Marwen. Anyway. Number four. First off, full disclosure, I am not a cat person. Second off, after watching this frankly mortifying film adaptation of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Cats, I'm not al- I'm not altogether sure I'm a movie person anymore either. Ow. <clears throat> That's yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to credit these because sometimes it can come back to bite you. Yeah. But at the same time, like number cats. three. Yeah, yeah. No, number three on the list. And this is the headline. Oh, God, my eyes. <laughs> what else wow. Is that's the headline, folks. Now that makes me want to see it. Just 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 for the suffering, you know, in case I'm having a really well, good day and I need to bring myself down. It's like, okay. That's exactly what this is, man. Number two. Cats is the worst thing to happen to cats since dogs. <laughs> yes, I I have I have seen that headline. Uh, oh dear. But it, my my personal favorite, number one, <clears throat> the cat's out of the bag. Let's put them back in and toss it in the river. Oh, like, oh that's, wow. That is excruciatingly harsh. Yeah, that's Maybe I'm funny. <laughs> that's brutal on a lot of levels. Wow. So, you know what's, what's amazing about the movie is the amount of talent that's in this thing. And yet, it's astounding. Apparently, um, yeah. 
<clears throat> but they say they're still working on it, even though it's been released, because they can just release a new digital version and call it Cats 1.1 or 1.2 or something. It's like a software update. Uh, apparently, they should just send out a blank screen with no soundtrack, and that might be an improvement. But I, I would think. But uh, that was the one of the two big movies that came out this week, kind of like the, the tentpole John Wick Matrix thing. We had one of those this weekend, a convergence of two big movies. Indeed. One of them... Um, you know, cats always land on their feet. This one, I think, had jam on its back, therefore landed jam side down <laughs> on a spike. Uh, it's not doing well. The other movie, apart from in China, The Rise of Skywalker. You saw that too, haven't you? Yes. Or, yes. They, they don't dig Star Wars in China. They don't. None of the Star Wars flicks have done well there. None of these, this series. Uh, I mean, the, <clears throat> this movie, I actually liked it. I've heard a lot of people panning it. Um, but I think, I think it's good. I think it's the best of the new trilogy. That's quite hopeful. Our, but, our good friend, Ted, the one person who always listens to the show, he also said that he, uh, he caught a sneak and he enjoyed it very much. He said, do not listen to the critics. So now I will listen. I will listen to you. See, it's, it's a good movie, but it does have some issues. Um, for example, the emperor comes back. This is not a, Spoil right. there, there's going to be spoilers, but not plot point spoilers. Yeah. Exactly. And we knew the Emperor came back. We heard him in the trailer. Right. And he's in this you know how they brought him back? This irked me. They put him in the crawl at the beginning. Hmm. Where all the letters are crawling across the screen, and one of them said, The Emperor has come back, and everyone goes, What, what that's it? Just whoop, there he is. I didn't care for that. Yeah, um, that's kind of odd. But in the first few minutes, um, the Emperor says, I made Snoke, who is the bad guy in the previous movies, the, right. the ruler of the First Order. But I'm going back to a line Yoda had at one point. Always two there are. OK, so let's see. We've got the Emperor. He's been around forever. Right. Um, Darth Maul, Darth Dooku, Darth Grievous, Darth Vader. When exactly did you have time to make Snoke? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, it, just me thinking here. But that might have been cleared up because we find out that the Emperor, and I, I may have misinterpreted this. I need to see it again just to just to clear up this beginning bit. The Emperor has always been on the Sith homeworld. And the one, if I understand this correctly, the one that died in Return of the Jedi, not a spoiler, it came out in 83. Yeah. Um, the, that one was a clone of Palpatine. Really? Mm. Okay. So maybe always two there are two Palpatines. Maybe. I'm thinking. It sounds like it. Um, I don't know if that's an actual issue. We'll find out eventually, I'm sure. Uh, how's this for an issue? At the beginning of the movie, Ray is talking with Leia, who I thought they did a good job of bringing her back, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, she says, I'm going to go run my, uh, my obstacle course. And so she takes off running and jumps over a gorge and up a tree and over another gorge and over a canyon. And all of a sudden, BB-8's there. And you kind of go, you left him back at the camp three gorges ago. You're a force-propelled Jedi <laughs> jumping over canyons that evil Knievel couldn't do. And this little ball with a hat followed you. How? I'm just saying. You're asking, you're um, asking for, for continuity from I, I asked just, just, a, just a touch. Come on now. Just a touch. I mean, it's better than the new droid they introduced in this one, which frankly looked like a hairdryer with a wheel. Mm, lovely. I'm just saying, we found him in the desert with Lando Calrissian, who is apparently, um, what, he went there with Luke to find a Sith thing and said, ah, Luke, you can go off and do your own thing. I'm going to stay here and hang out at the party because I'm Lando Calrissian. And that's what I do. That sounds like Lando. I guess. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I, I actually do think it was a good movie. Adam Driver still looks like a very young Snape. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, there were... Uh, some beautiful effects to it. Like when they, they, they blew up yet another planet. Yeah. It's Star Wars and that's what you do. Uh, but the effect for it this time, I think, has been better than any of the other effects of blowing up planets really? they've done so far. Interesting. I they, thought, it was, thought it was very nice. They've done some nice, good planet killing. Very much. You know, sorry about the people on it. Oh. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of cameos. They were probably all in the road show of cats. Uh, <laughs> any any particularly wonderful, amazing, cool cameos that the you could mention? The two very cool cameos. Uh, one, I absolutely was not expecting Harrison Ford to show up. I wasn't really sure if he was a force ghost or not. Mm. But he was 
He was in <clears throat> Adam Driver's head. Ah. And that counts. I was not expecting that. I thought that was good. And okay. yes, you know I'm going to mention Wedge. Of course. Because that, that's that's my boy from the original trilogy. It's the only reason they, you went to see this. D- yes, it was, actually. They put him in the movie. <laughs> he was in the gun turret in the Millennium Falcon for four seconds. Hey, he had he got like promoted. half a line. I'm, I'm not happy about that. He was in the movie. Fine. Whatever. That's okay. He wasn't just in the movie. He was in the Millennium Falcon. He was. I, that, that's that's big fine. Step up. Big step so was up. Yen Yub. What's your point? It's, it, <laughs> okay, so I'm not surprised there's a new droid because <laughs> got to sell those toys. Oh, um, my big question, and, and if this if this is a, is a plot spoiler, then don't answer. But it, is is Adam Driver still still a painfully awkward dweeb in this movie, or is there some character growth finally? I think we get some character growth. Okay, thank God, because. I've seen a few more movies with Adam Driver. I'll mention one in a, in a little bit. He's an excellent actor. He is. Like, give him something to do, for God's sakes, please. I mean, he is so wasted and has been, perhaps not in this final version, but... Padme man, Amidala was wasted in the... in the. She's a great actress. Yeah. But you put her in the Star Wars movies and they give her... Here, this is a piece of wood. Emulate. Yeah, it's a, it's a Star Wars tradition ever since the prequels. Uh, anyway... Uh, let's see. There, there were a couple other cameos. Basically, Bespin and actually Wicket, even played by Warwick Davis, was in the movie very briefly. <laughs> nice. Uh, this is a bit of a spoiler. Mercifully, there are no Gungans in this film. Mm, good. I was slightly worried about that. And uh, I think <clears throat> the, 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 the main, th- well, not the main thing, one of the things I really liked at the end of this movie fixed something from the original Star Wars that should have happened. Yeah. Uh, Maz Kanata, and I'm probably mispronouncing the name, the little, the Linda Hunt character of this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the one who had Luke's lightsaber, and we still don't know how she got that. Gave eBay. Chewbacca the medal he should have gotten at the end of the original Star Wars. Ah, nice. And it, it, it's a blink and you miss it scene, but just that it's there, I think is very nice. She probably got that off eBay too. That's yeah, entirely probable. The, uh, my, my two, I guess my two big issues with this movie though and i know i've mentioned a bunch of little nitpicky things really yeah um and i realize that this is the end of the big star wars series but you didn't have to return of the king the ending because to me there seemed oh, really? like there were like four or five different endings where you go oh here's mm. the climactic sit no nope. <clears throat> wait that's the climactic no wait there's one over, there's a climax over here and a climax over here. You think it's a porn movie at this point. It's not, <laughs> it's just lots of different climaxes all over the place. Whew. And um, I, I spoke with, spoke with my daughter, not about the porn thing, about uh, one other thing that we picked up on with this movie that I think heavy duty sci-fi fans are going to pick up on. Mm-hmm. The premise for this movie was basically lifted, including the Marcus bit out of the fourth season of Babylon 5. If you have seen the fourth season really? of Babylon 5, you've seen this movie already. Wow. Some of the characters are different. Actually, a lot of the characters are different. Some of them are the same, but it, it's it's roughly the same plot. There is still the same sacrifice kind of things going on. It is the same storyline. So I think they kind of cheated a bit. Meanwhile, was it a fun movie? Yes. Was it worth going to see? Yes. Was it a good ending? Uh, there was a lot of meh to, to the ending for me. I'm like, mm. I, I honestly still think that they could have stopped at Return of the Jedi and we would have been happy. Oh, definitely. They could have stopped at Return of the Jedi. But you know what? It's <clears throat> Rise of Skywalker is the best of the new trilogy. If you've seen the other two, go see this one. So now I have a new hope, pun intended. Uh, yeah, multiple climaxes. I mean, you know, they had to, they had all those storylines, so they they needed to have a lot of money shots. Uh, it goes back to the climaxes. There you go. Um, yeah, so now I want to see it because now I have two trusted sources that say, it's good, go see it, as opposed to a sea of critics who say no. Um, I can see why they would say that because... There are a lot of little things, but that that's being nitpicky. This is Star Wars. It's supposed yeah. to be fun. Exactly. And, you know, like I was talking to my kids about it last night. It's like my expectations for this movie is that it will suck because that's what the past how many decade and a half they've been, they've been building up to, to that. I mean, none of these yeah. have been particularly good, I don't think. 
So I don't really have much of an expectation for this. And I'm still going to go see it. Even without your comments, I was going to go see it. Just It's Star Wars, of course, you're going to go see it. <clears throat> but you know, if, if it's an improvement, then great. Oh, yeah. I, I will even give you something to look for. Because at the end of the end of the movie, there ends up being lots of couples all over the place, which you right. kind of expect because mm-hmm. there, there's lots of male female things, and I'm still not really sure if Poe and Finn end up being a couple. Don't care. Mm-hmm. I am amused, and I'm tying this back into the Lord of the Rings stuff. Pippin is in this movie, and he <laughs> ends up with a big CG slug as a girlfriend at the end of this. I think <laughs> it's it's something to look for. <laughs> Let me All know right. if it ends up being a th- it maybe it's oh. called Mary. I don't know. I, 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 um, do, I do look forward to that. <laughs> it's just a little something to look for. But uh, that's, you know, the, I think that's easily considered the, going to be considered the last big movie of 2019. But did it make the top 10 movies of the year? That's up to hmm. mm-hmm. uh, for me. No pressure. For me, it did not because first, I haven't seen it. And second, from the descriptions I have from people who liked it, it wouldn't make it anyway. Um, because top 10 lists aren't for good movies. They aren't for movies that are worthwhile because they don't disappoint you and make you cry <clears throat> unless they're supposed to. And there are a couple of those in here too. They're for movies that are at least really, really good, if not great. So I have my 10 and they are in reverse order because no one starts a list with number 10. I mean, number one, I do start a list number with number 10. 10. Yeah, one of whatever. Well, it's got a I, one in it. <clears throat> It does. It has a one and it has a big zero behind it. So these are in relatively correct order. Uh, you know, I may, may change my mind as time goes on. And there's still a couple movies that I want to see this year, such as Jojo Rabbit. I have a feeling that will correct the list, but haven't had a chance to catch it yet. So for now, my top 10 starts off with number 10, The Lighthouse. This is a atmospheric, creepy horror, psychological thriller flick. This is a follow up. I think not a follow-up. It's just the second film from the director, Robert Eggers, who directed The Witch, which is a great atmospheric, creepy horror movie, which was, was black and white. This is also black and white, shot on 35 millimeter film, so he can't make changes now that it's in the theaters. Uh, <laughs> and the aspect ratio is even the 4-3, the square, but almost square aspect Ooh. ratio. Very cool looking film. Uh, super rich contrast. Just the way the film looks. It's really claustrophobic because you've got these big black bars on either side of the screen if you're watching at home and if you were lucky enough to see the theater, the curtains were closed in on it. So despite the fact that it takes place on an island with a lighthouse and the ocean and it's all this big open space, it's really, you just feel closed in, you feel trapped with these two characters. Two men go off in, I believe it's in the 1890s. They are on their keep, on their watch at at a lighthouse, this remote lighthouse up in the... The nor- they have to fight a nor'easter, so it's up there. Uh, Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Willem Dafoe is awesome. One of his best performances ever. He is great. Robert Pattinson holds his own. It's like, no worries about this guy not pulling off anything, let alone Batman. It's like, forget about Twilight. That was not his fault. Dude's paid. He, went, he read the lines he was given. I blame that on the script. Yeah. Excellent, creepy, psychological thriller. People are having weird visions. Maybe they're weird visions. Maybe they're really happening. Uh, Just a great atmospheric, creepy film. If you like maniacs with axes, well, you may get your payoff in here too, but it's not that kind of a movie. It's not a slasher movie, but it's an excellent character study of people going nuts in bad circumstances. Highly recommend The Lighthouse. Uh, Number nine for me, and... Almost didn't make the list, but eventually the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, this is one of the top 10 movies of the year, is Tarantino's latest film. His ninth movie, as a matter of fact, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like almost any Tarantino movie, it's a really, really good movie. Great, great script. Pacing is excellent. Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio. DiCaprio, It takes takes place in the 60s. DiCaprio is kind of a washed up actor. Brad Pitt is his stunt double, who is also kind of his intervention specialist who drives him around because DiCaprio's had too many DUIs. He's his friend, etc. <laughs> really funny at places where it's supposed to be because it's Tarantino. Great performances all around. Uh, this also, it ties in to the 60s Hollywood with the Manson family because DiCaprio's character just happens to live next door to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. Google that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, things happen between the Manson family 
and the characters who happen to live next door, DiCaprio and <clears throat> Pitt. Not that Pitt lives there, but he comes over and hangs out a lot. Really well done. Unlike most Tarantino movies, there's not much violence in this movie. Until there is at the end, and then, oh my God, it is crazy brutal. Like, worse than anything he's done before. In a good way. So, really good characterizations. Really good writing. Uh, not the best Tarantino movie, in, in my mind. Because uh, he's still trying to catch up to Pulp Fiction, and probably never will. But no, probably no one else will either, so that's okay. Uh, not for the kiddies, but a very, very enjoyable film. Uh, number eight for me quite a bit of a change here this is a very shifting gears just a bit calm yeah just a bit interesting not really a character study but it's kind of a thought experiment it's called yesterday guy wakes up and nobody remembers the beatles the songs aren't there they're gone he's the only one who remembers them for at least for most of the movie and he decides he's an aspiring singer songwriter and he's not particularly good and this happens just because he's sitting there in a party. It's the <clears throat> the stars Himesh Patel. This is from Danny Boyle, uh, who's done such a weird, wide range of, of films. Um, <laughs> let's see. The first one that comes to mind for me, for Danny Boyle, is Slumdog Millionaire. And the next one is 28 Days Later. Also did 127 Hours, so it's like any practically anything is is a Danny Boyle subject. So the guy wakes up. He doesn't really think anything about it because why would he know that no one knows the Beatles? And he just starts playing a song with sitting with other friends and they're all going, oh my God, that's a great song. Did you write it? And he's like, you're kidding, right? Because it's a Beatles song. Of course, everybody knows the Beatles. Nobody does in this world. So he decides to take advantage of it and he starts releasing Beatles songs and everyone hails him as the most brilliant artist in the world ever, which they kind of would. And he starts dealing with the moral implications of, is this really right? Should I really be doing this? Uh, has some funny moments. Has a lot of touching moments. Really interesting premise. Absolutely brilliantly done. Highly recommend yesterday. And yeah, has kind of a good soundtrack because Beatles, duh. <laughs> Number seven, another turn. Book smart. If you remember the movie Super Bad, which I thought was really, really good. Take Super Bad, change the two leads to young ladies, make them really, really smart, and make the movie a lot better. And I really liked Superbad, but this movie is excellent. Really smart film, no pun intended. Really funny film. It basically it's about two high school senior girls who have been who are book smart because they've had their nose to the grindstone their entire high school career. They've never partied once. They've never had fun. Here's their last chance to go to a party and they're going to blow it out and have a blast. And it has the feels to it because you know, there are some disagreements and et cetera, et cetera. And they have to establish relationships and figure out what's going on. But mainly it's funny. And man, is it ever a good movie. Olivia Wilde, the actress, the actress Olivia Wilde. Also now the director Olivia Wilde. This is her first movie as an act, as a director. And it's like, wow, if, if this is your first picture, like really looking forward to the next thing. Please she keep does. it up. Please keep it up. Oh my gosh. It's just, and it's filmed in a very smart, uh, fast paced way, but not like intercut, like it's made for the MTV generation, which God, that's like boomers at this point. Right. But you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Uh, really good, witty, sharp movie. And the leads are excellent in book smart again, highly recommended. And I'm staying in the funny, fast, entertaining vein with knives out. Uh, we were talking about this before when, when the trailer first hit, because there've been rumors going around forever that they're going to do a reboot of clue. And I thought, Oh my God, they got these people to do Clue? This is crazy. Yeah, it's not Clue. It's similar to that in that it is a murder mystery, which is fun. And it is from Ryan Johnson. And the cast is just... Ridiculously large. For, yeah. Uh, 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 of people we know. Yes. Extremely good actors and actresses. And they're all actors. And they all do fantastic jobs. Here's the cast list. Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Anna de Armas who was in Blade Runner 2, 049. 049. J Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, Don Johnson, Tony Collette, Lakeith Stanfield, Christopher Plummer, and then it starts getting to people that you may not be that w well aware of, but still some names that you know, like, oh, Frank Oz. <laughs> Weird. Joseph Gordon-Levitt actually does a voiceover in this. I mean, this movie is absolutely hilarious. It is a very interesting mystery at the same time. Not easy to pull off. Uh, 
this is the guy, Ryan Johnson, his first movie, I believe it was his first movie. The one movie I know him from is Brick, which is a high school murder mystery that's about 15 years old. Excellent movie. Um, also, keep him away from Star Wars and we'll be Yeah, fine. yeah, exactly. Eh, you know, you work with what you got. Uh, also, The Looper, but I mean, this is easily his best movie. And I like what a lot of the stuff he's done before, but this movie is hilarious. It's excellent. And as I put in the notes, I don't think it's so much of a whodunit, but it's more of a who did what. Because you know early on that someone gets killed and they show who does it, except maybe that's not how it really happened, which is part of the fun in this movie. And everyone, again, everyone is terrific in this movie. Uh, man, what a bunch of weird, weird, weird characters. So highly recommend Knives Out. Absolutely great, fun night at the movies or at your TV screen. Number five, big change of pace. Going back to the serious stuff with Motherless Brooklyn. Uh, I kind of think of this as Chinatown light, but that's insulting the movie because there's nothing light about it. Um, but it's similar to that story. And it's it's a period piece. In this case, it's set in the 50s. And it's on the other side of the coast because it takes place in Brooklyn. Duh, Motherless Brooklyn. Edward Norton stars in it. He is a private detective. He's not the head of his agency, but he is one of the top guys in his agency, a small agency. And he's trying to find out what happened to his boss? Because his boss gets killed. And he's on the case trying to figure it out. And it turns out there's high-level political corruption. There's a character who is quite similar to Donald Trump and just happens to be played by Alec Baldwin. Haha. Uh, but again... Coincidence? Um, coin- no. Coinky dink, I think. Uh, but not a comedy. It has a few funny moments to it, but really good character study of Norton's character, who, by the way, has Tourette's and... Not that Tourette's would ever be a picnic, but Tourette's in the 50s, no fun at all. Mm-hmm. And extremely bright. Uh, Norton is extremely bright, but so was his character. Uh, he also wrote this along as directed it. And it's just great, great character study. Edward Norton is just a phenomenally good actor. I mean, from way back with American History X. And I don't know if this is his best work, but I'd say one of his top three movies ever. He is terrific in this. And the movie is absolutely great. Just beautifully done. We were talking about it before, the attention to detail. I mean, the cars are grimy because they're new in New York. Of course, they're going to be grimy. You know, it's it's just so well done. Some of the shots are just beautiful. But terrific story. Motherless Brooklyn. Highly, highly recommended. And we'll go on to another film. Also beautifully shot. Amazing looking. And there's a lot more to it than looks. It's Ad Astra. And it's not Ed Asner. But this is not Ed Asner at all. Ad Astra, Latin for To the Stars. And that's what it's about. And another beautiful item for a lot of the audience, Brad Pitt. Again, Brad Pitt's in another one of these movies. And Brad Pitt is an astronaut in the future who has to go find his dad because his dad may be involved in uh, some events which may put an end to the world. Ha ha! Fun! He thinks his dad is dead, but he takes the job anyway because, yeah, kind of important to save the, the earth. This movie is, it is kind of slow paced, but when there are action scenes, they're extremely well done. And there are plenty of action scenes. Uh, at the same time, like a lot of the films that are on this list, this is a great character study of Brad Pitt's character. And I think this is his best work ever, hands down. And he's a very underrated which, actor. Which is saying something, because he's actually done a lot of really good stuff. He has, absolutely. And But he is phenomenally good in this movie. He's he's, he's great in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But man, it does, he's just incredible in this movie. And even if he was just okay, this would be a really good movie, because it's a very interesting plot. It's really well written. Like I said, beautifully filmed. Tommy Lee Jones co-stars in this movie. Uh, man. And he's excellent as well, but this is this, this is definitely Brad Pitt's movie. As as think of two thousand one, a space odyssey, but there's a really compelling character at the in the middle of it, which the most compelling character in two thousand one was a computer. So wow. it could have it could have used that. Love the movie, but different kind of film. This this movie is just absolutely beautiful to watch, and it's a really great story as well. We're getting there. We're, We're getting, getting there. there. We're up to number three. And I chose, I'm not sure if this is a horror movie, but I, this is a horror movie the same way The Lighthouse is a horror movie. In that, yeah, but it's a lot more than a horror movie. So I'm talking about Us. The reviews are in as number three? 
Awesome. <laughs> we are. Yeah, yeah. Us yeah. is <clears throat> Us is the follow up to Jordan Peele's Get Out, which is an absolutely incredible horror movie. Uh, also a psychological thriller, also political and social commentary. Us is too, except it has nothing to do with Get Out. Us is a film about a family who has to deal with home invaders who look exactly like them, and which is kind of creepy and weird, which totally freaks them out. Well, these home invaders, these doppelgangers, are, they're a lot stranger than just the fact that they look like them because there's something very, very wrong with them. And the movie explores that and gets to the point if you figure out why they're so weird, what's so off about them. And then it expands. It's not just a home invasion movie. It turns out things are going on other places as well. So it's about the battle between the family and the doppelgangers and the broader scope of how this is affecting a lot of other people other than just them. So again, looks great. Terrific script. Very, very suspenseful. Great twist at the end. And Lupita Nyong'o? <laughs> She's been excellent in everything she's done. If she does not win Best Actress, I don't, not that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences would care, but I don't think I'll watch the Oscars again because holy crap. I, and, and award shows are difficult, right? Because you're not all doing the same material. So it's also subjective. It's like, how can you compare someone doing Hamlet, you know, to doing Spider-Man? Spider-Man, yeah, a superhero movie. It's like, well, you can both be really good, even though they're very different formats. But yeah. there's no way in hell any actor, actor as in a male or female, did a better job than Lupita Nyong'o in this. I mean, she is freaking incredible. I mean, this is one of the best, absolutely one of the best acting performances of the decade. I mean, it just knocks it completely out of the park. I just it, Aside from that, this movie is worth watching. But man, if the movie had been bad and she had this performance, it would still be worth watching just for her. Just, man, what a movie. And Again, what a performance. So for number two, a big change in tone. Just a bit. I'm, I'm going with a superhero movie. Uh, even even though Marty Scorsese doesn't like them, doesn't think they're cinema, I watched The Irishman hoping it would make the list. And I kind of liked it, but in the notes, I wrote that it's a tired retread. And it's closer to a tired retread than it is a great movie. And it's on a lot of critics, best of the, the year mo- lists. Some critics have said it's his best movie ever. And yeah, I, I've seen De Niro play this character. I've seen Pacino play this character. I think um, I've played this character at some point. You know, it's and it's not that they're not good. It's not that it's not well done and it's shot really well, but I've seen the tracking shots before. I mean, there's nothing new here for three and a half hours. There's no new ground here. I, you know, and it's well done. It's, it's much more than competent, but you know, I saw Goodfellas much better. I, I don't need to see this which is kind of sad because I was really hoping this would be really, really good. And again, this is Netflix making inroads, which I want to mention a a marriage story, not a marriage story, marriage story, which just missed my list, which is also a Netflix production, which is great. And really cool to see Scarlett Johansson play something other than Black Widow, which she plays in Avengers Endgame. Which is number two. Which is number two. Yeah. What a movie. Now, partly I put this where I did simply because it's the payoff for what a thousand years of marvel movies feels like it anyway yeah Yeah. in a good way um i mean there are people who have grown up with the marvel films now which is kind of incredible uh but it it wraps up not just avengers infinity war but it wraps up the entire storyline so well and yeah there are little tiny plot holes here and glitches there and it's like you don't care because there are so many big payoffs in this film and it's not like the multiple endings. It's it's not Return of the King. It's like, my God, can we have an ending here? They hit when they're supposed to hit. Uh, yeah. Just, and you don't have In the to, way they're supposed to hit. Yeah. You don't have to be a comic book fan to feel the depth. A- a- as Scorsese said, there's nothing at stake. It's like, I- I'm pretty sure there's something at stake. Some and I'm not talking about died in this movie. Yeah. You know? I'm not talk- and I'm not even talking about that. I'm not even talking about the deaths and people come back and blah, blah, blah. I'm not even talking about the end of the universe or half of the people in the universe. I'm not talking about that at all. It's the emotional payoff of characters that have been extremely well-written and extremely well-portrayed and how they react and how they handle this situation. It's Thor just giving up because he's depressed and he's got like a super bad dad bod, and yet he figures out that he's still worthy. 
that's a great message. Yeah. It's, it's Captain America standing there when everybody else is gone and he's the last one and he doesn't care because he's got a job to do. And I mean, he stands there and he's ready. It's him <clears throat> picking up the hammer, <clears throat> which I can hardly say right. it because it's a huge moment. I actually think that that is the single biggest movie moment of the year. Oh, yeah. Because I, I, I've that's a scene that I've watched repeatedly. Yay, DVD. Um, <laughs> I have specifically watched that scene over repeatedly. And each time I see it, the the hairs on my arm get up and do a little dance and there's this rush of adrenaline and it's not just it wasn't just the first time you see it for me it's every time i've seen it oh it's every time i even think about it i mean i'm getting kind of choked up which may sound silly but captain america has always been about hope and courage and doing the right thing and it's all there in that moment it's incredible you know so for any director to say oh there's nothing at stake it's like Clearly, you haven't watched these films. Clearly. Clearly. So uh, even aside from being the culmination of everything, uh, the fact that they made all those films work together at the end, it's an incredibly well-done film. So many big moments for so many characters. Looks amazing. Uh, Just wow. Great, great movie. But for me, it's not the best movie of the year. And I understand it was your best movie of the year, and I can totally see that. Well, when we looked at our lists, we just flipped it. We That's just flipped it. it. And for my number one movie, I went for A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Um, I can't say this is Tom Hanks' best work. Because for me, I still think that's probably Philadelphia. Or maybe, maybe, Drag- yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Dragnet. Could be Dragnet. It's probably not Turner and Hooch, but that's about the only one. Uh, the guy's just an incredible actor and always has been. Um, which is not to say this is not a great Tom Hanks performance. It's top three for yeah, sure. Absolutely. He, he is terrific in this movie. Uh, again, again, if you don't know, this is this is about uh, Fred Rogers, the PBS children's show host, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, there was a documentary that came out last year, which is excellent, the best documentary of the year last year. But this movie is just so well done. And this is not about Rogers' life so much. This is really about an, one incident in his life. And it's really more about a journalist who is assigned to do just a quick story about Fred Rogers. He works for Esquire magazine. When we talked about this, when we initially reviewed the movie and we laughed because they give him a, an assignment, he has to write 400 words on Fred Rogers. And it's like, okay, that's like 15 minutes work. I mean, that's crazy. And he's upset about it because he's a big hotshot investigative reporter and he's, he's offended. But his editor tells him is like, he, Rogers is the only person who would talk to you because of your reputation as being kind of a jerk. And he's not kind of a jerk. He's a massive jerk. So he goes and he interviews Rogers and Rogers winds up interviewing him more. So, and they become friends because Rogers, uh, by all accounts, was an incredibly good, kind person. He wasn't a saint, as his wife makes clear in the film and as she has in real life. But the point is, since she makes in the movie, that he worked at being who he was. He didn't just come out being this wonderful, sweet, kind person who did his best for everybody. He worked at doing that, which is, again, a great message. But just the way this thing is filmed... You see, anytime that they're going to the studio, they use the shots of the weird little make-believe village, little town that he had with all little plastic or probably, I'm sorry, wooden houses and little, little cars going around and stuff every single time. And it goes to that 4-3 aspect ratio before it like stretches back out again. It's just shot incredibly well. Uh, Hanks, Hanks is awesome. And again, it's, it's really not about Rogers. It's about his effect on people. And the, scene, the scenes in the trailer of... Them, Rogers and the reporter riding the subway and people just start spontaneously singing. It's a beautiful day, neighborhood, beautiful moment. Uh, to me, the best moment to me is a part where they're having a talk and they're just in some little coffee shop and Rogers just asks him if he would just sit with him silently for, for a minute, literally a minute, just to gather his thoughts, just to think, just to be quiet. Because being quiet is important. And I don't mean not speaking, but quieting your mind. And literally, it's a minute, and there's no sound in the movie, and the audience is just captured by this. It's just an amazing moment. One, one of a many in this movie. That's absolutely, for me, as much as I liked all the other movies on this list, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, absolutely the best movie of the year. Tom Hanks for Best Actor again? Yeah. I mean, I'd be shocked if he's not nominated. I don't know if he'll win, because like I said, uh, see, part of the thing with Hanks, and especially this character, 
is it just seemed absolutely effortless for him. Because I think Tom Hanks probably has an awful lot in common. <laughs> well, it's, it's genetic. <laughs> yeah. Th- that was, to me, that was the most bizarre thing to find out. Right. Uh, when Tom Hanks found out after they shot the movie and just before it came out that he's actually related to Mr. Rogers. Yeah, crazy. Which, you know, bizarre, but it could happen because it did. It did indeed. So, but a lot of great movies. And, and I left off a lot that, you know, would be honorable Honorable mentions for sure. You mentioned uh, in your list Alita Battle Angel, which I really, really enjoyed. Captain Marvel, which same thing. I keep thinking Captain Marvel came out last year, but no, it was it was this year. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I thought of Alita, too, because it just seems like it's been forever since it came out. But again, uh, Terminator Dark Fate. Really, really enjoyed that movie. Just didn't make my top ten, but... right. There were a lot of excellent movies last year. I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised you didn't put Joker on the list. Yeah, I thought about it. And again, it just like just missed my cut. Now, as far as performances, this is one of the reasons why I think Tom Hanks might not win, might not win Best Actor because, wow, <laughs> he's I mean, kind of good. <laughs> it, just a bit. Yeah. So, you know, on this show, we try to give you a good, good idea of what there is out there and what should be seen. And holy cow, did we give you a lot of things to see this week? We did. So come back next week because we're going to have the best and worst of the decade because, hey, it's not just the year that's ending. But in the meantime, we've given you a list. Get out and go see a movie. Captain, we're losing power in the warp engines. I think we should be leaving now. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Uh, And on that unusually harmonious bombshell, it is time to end. I am... Very disappointed! Man, we have a weird job. It's shameful, but uh, eh, it's a living. And like that, he's gone. Darn, that's the end.